Good morning and welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. I'm Pastor Jason Van Bemmel from Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. Our 892nd day together in God's Word, we come to John chapter 19. Jesus before Pontius Pilate delivered over to be crucified. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come now to a very special part of your Word, a very precious chapter that tells us of the most important act of love and redemption ever that your son would take our place on the cross to fulfill all of your promises and accomplish our salvation quiet our hearts help us to be attentive to your word and teach us by your holy spirit lord we pray in jesus name amen john 19 then pilate took jesus and flogged him And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus. And he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, This man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier and also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. 
When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Mother, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, and said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place, that the scripture might be fulfilled, not one of his bones will be broken. And again another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate, that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about seventy-five pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. John chapter 19 is one of the places of high holy ground within God's holy word because Jesus here is crucified for our sins. And it is John that records that wonderful cry of Jesus from the cross, it is finished, to tell us die in the Greek, which declares that all of our debt has been paid, all of our sins have been forgiven, all of the promises of God have been fulfilled, all of the plans and purposes of God have been finished. The work of redemption is finished, it is complete. All the ceremonial sacrifices and that whole system of law that was given reached its fulfillment in Jesus on the cross, which is so much of what John's gospel is about. John is showing us how Jesus is the fulfillment of the plans and purposes of God from the beginning to redeem a people to himself. But we begin with Jesus on trial before Pontius Pilate. Pilate plays an unwilling role in this. This doesn't mean that Pilate's a good guy. One of the criticisms that's been made about the Gospels is that they almost portray Pilate as being sort of sensitive to the truth and tender-hearted. When we know from history that Pilate was a man who was ready to use crucifixion whenever it was deemed necessary and who could rule with quite an iron fist. And that's true, but Pilate is also just a man. And he has fears, and he has questions, and he has hang-ups, and he has insecurities, like all other men. And here he's dealing with a man who's unique, who's different from anybody else who's ever been put before him, and he knows that. And he, and he knows he's also innocent, and he knows he's being set up. And he's enough of a politician that if it was just some guy who was being set up because he was an inconvenience to the Sanhedrin, he might have just gone along with it. But this man is different. This man has asked Pilate some penetrating questions and has challenged Pilate's understanding of truth and of kingdom and rule. And so Pilate is an unwilling participant in this. He wants to have his hands washed of it. He even says in verse 6, uh, Take him yourselves 
and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. And it's the response of the Jewish leadership here that is very shocking. They say, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. When actually Jesus came to fulfill that law that they have, and he didn't make himself the Son of God, he was and is the Son of God. He spoke the truth. And so they're claiming the ground in the law of God that Jesus is the very embodiment of just shows how misguided they are. But Pilate wants to get more information from Jesus. He's stalling. He's trying to figure out what angle he can take here. He's a politician trying to work the angles. Where are you from? Because he made himself the son of God. But where are you from? And Jesus doesn't answer and he gets upset. You will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And then Jesus again confronts Pilate's misunderstanding of kingdom and authority and rule like he had in chapter 18 where he said, my kingdom is not of this world, but I come to testify of the truth and whoever is of the truth listens to me. Here he says, you have no authority except what's been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. And from that time on, Pilate sought to release him. Because he, he, I think he saw something in Jesus that just cut him to the core. I'm not saying Pilate became a Christian or had faith. It's just he was deeply unsettled by this man who was so different and who had such wisdom and who said things unlike the way that anybody else spoke in Pilate's life. Jesus very clearly doesn't go along with the world in its way of thinking. He is a very God-centered, very kingdom of God-centered, very truth-oriented stance, and that sets him apart from the world. And we, his followers, should be the same way. But the Jewish leadership, they have a very worldly way of looking at it. If you release this man, you're not Caesar's friend. See, they're thinking like worldly politicians. That's how they think. And so he says, presents the presents Jesus to the crowd. He thinks maybe the crowd will sort of tip things against the leadership because he knows there's sometimes tension between the leadership and the crowd. But the crowd wants him crucified. And Pilate says, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answer, we have no king but Caesar. That shows how deeply entrenched in worldly politics they are that they could stand in the presence of the rightful king, the son of David, the son of God, God's anointed Messiah. They could stand in his presence and say, we have no king but Caesar. In Jeremiah, we've been confronting the idea of idolatry and having two masters and the chief priests here are a good example of it. They had bowed the knee to the master of Rome. They had bowed the knee to Caesar. They had appeased Caesar to secure their own place. Way back in John 11, when we were there, we saw that after the raising of Lazarus, they knew that they had to get rid of Jesus because if the people followed him, they would lose their place and their nation. They would lose their political power. And so here, the culmination of their sellout idolatry, we have no king but Caesar. And so he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus. He goes out bearing his own cross. He goes to a place of the skull, Golgotha. Just a lot of debate about what, where exactly this place is and what exactly it means. We don't know for sure. Um, there is a story told in legend that it was the place where David brought the skull of Goliath. It's also a place of legend where Adam was buried from his death. Um, we don't know. It might have just been a, a rock promontory that looked like a skull. Or it might have been a place where so many people had been crucified by the Romans because it was kind of a public place along the roadway into Jerusalem, just outside the city walls, but still on the same hill, that it may be just associated with death. We don't know for sure. Um, but Jesus goes there and he's carrying his cross. And um, Matthew tells us that Simon of Cyrene 
had to carry the cross the rest of the way because he couldn't carry it the whole way. We're not given that detail here in John, but he carries it out. And here we're told these details about this sign, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek, for all to see, Pilate publicly testifying to the world in the three best known languages, Greek, the universal language of the Roman Empire for trade and commerce, Latin, the uh, language of the Roman Empire for government and rule and law, and Aramaic, the regional language of the people in that area. So for the people, for the merchants and tradesmen, and for the government authorities, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And of course, the chief priests don't like that. Don't say he is the King of the Jews. Say, I say, he said, I'm the King of the Jews. And Pilate simply says, what I have written, I have written. We see that Christ is fulfilling the scriptures. That's what John is really emphasizing very clearly. Every part of the scripture that talks about the crucifixion of Jesus has to be fulfilled. And so from Psalm 22, they divided my garments among them, casting lots for my clothing. That's done because the inner tunic of Jesus is seamless and they don't want to divide that up. So they divide up the other articles of his clothing, but this one they they gamble for, essentially. We see the heart of Jesus in taking care of his earthly mother, Mary, of his mother, Mary, and taking care of his youngest disciple, John. John wrote this gospel. He was almost certainly the youngest of the disciples. He was also the only one who could safely stand at the foot of the cross openly, identifying as a follower of Jesus because he and his family were known to the chief priest, to Annas. So he had a little bit of protection there. The women could be there because women aren't generally going to be arrested for these kinds of political issues. Um, and so Jesus takes care of them, takes care of Mary, takes care of John by connecting them to each other and providing. This is telling us almost certainly that Joseph is dead by this time. He probably died shortly before Jesus began his earthly ministry because we don't hear anything about Joseph in any of the Gospels after the birth narratives. And then he says, I thirst to fulfill scripture. They give him sour wine, basically wine vinegar. Um, and uh, it's it's sort of a it's sort of a cheap, cheap wine. Um, kind of rancid. That's what they give him. And then finally, he says, it is finished. To tell us die, paid in full. All that is given to Jesus, he finished. He finished the work that the Father gave him to do. Now, the Father will glorify him that we'll see the next time we're in John's gospel. But all the work of salvation is done. But they pierce him. Blood and water comes out. That shows that he truly is dead. Some doctors have looked at this and said, that means Jesus actually died of a broken heart because something about like the pericardium, which is this layer of fluid, would have ruptured as his heart exploded, that Jesus literally died of a broken heart because when his side was pierced, blood and water flowed out. That means that his heart exploded. Um, that can be caused by severe dehydration and strain, um, and he was certainly under that. Uh, but the blood and water also signals to us the forgiveness and the cleansing that Jesus purchased for us. Blood to cover our guilt, water to cleanse us of the filth of our sin. And again, all scripture was fulfilled. Not one of his bones is broken and they will look upon him whom they have pierced. Um, those, uh, those scriptures um, coming from Psalm 34 uh, and then from uh, the prophet Zechariah. And then Jesus is buried in a rich man's tomb which again, Isaiah 53, uh, tells us that they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, Isaiah 53, 9. And so every detail, every detail is exactly according to scripture. Why? Because Jesus came to fulfill the word of God. As the word of God incarnate, which is how John's gospel begins, Jesus comes to embody and to fulfill the word of God. We can have a sure and certain hope of our salvation because... Jesus is faithful, faithful to the end. He did not shrink back from his responsibility. He did not leave out the smallest detail. He did everything that was required, and he did it to the fullest. We can know that our salvation is finished, is secure, is complete, and is unshakable because it is found in 
Jesus Christ in his finished work. It doesn't depend on us. We're not the ones doing the work. He's the one who did the work. And that is our hope for life and for eternity. Let's pray. Father in heaven, what a wonderful Savior we have in Jesus our Lord. What a wonderful work he did to save us beyond our comprehension to be made sin for us, to be crushed for our iniquities, bruised for our transgressions, pierced for us. We thank you for such a Savior. We thank you for such a salvation. Help us to trust in and follow Jesus. For in him and him alone, we have everything we need for life and eternity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining me for John 19. We are going to be going back to the prophet Jeremiah tomorrow. I hope you have a blessed day in the Lord. 